this so, conference yes, we're will this now be recorded. And, uh, we'll share it on our website and social media so that people who weren't able to attend today's session can watch it at a later time. I will send everyone a link to the recording via email after this session, along with uh, an evaluation mm -hmm. to gather your feedback on today's session. Um, I have muted everyone's uh, microphones to eliminate background noise. I will unmute everyone when we open the floor to questions. Uh, if you have any question, um, or if you have a question that we don't get around to answering, you can write it in the, the chat box in uh, the bottom uh, right portion of the screen. Oh, and I will share the presentation. Oops. Okay. So, so I've just shared the, the presentation here. So I will um, go over what we're going to cover today. If I can advance to the next slide. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, who Cooperative Housing International is and uh, also explain what a housing cooperative is very quickly. And, and then I will pass the floor on to Blaise Lambert, who will go over um, how you get started with uh, some key questions you need to answer and uh, or some early decisions uh, that your group needs to make. Then uh, clarifying your purpose, some uh, points on how to develop your group. And, uh, and then at the end, we'll go over the next webinar, the date and some of the topics that we, we plan to cover. So Cooperative Housing International is uh, an international organization that is one of the sectors of uh, the International Cooperative Alliance. We represent housing co-ops worldwide. And uh, so we facilitate uh, the, the sharing of information and resources um, and, uh, and data to uh, our members and to housing cooperatives uh, around the globe. We promote good practices and we also uh, encourage cooperatives to uh, reach the sustainable development goals. And uh, we facilitate networking and, uh, and help to form partnerships. So at, uh, at our various events, uh, at board meetings and at uh, housing symposiums and conferences, we, we try to connect uh, cooperative housing uh, associations from around the world um, because together we form uh, a stronger union, a stronger, um, a stronger voice, and, uh, and we can be louder when we're, when we're uh, working together towards the common goals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we also um, promote one of the cooperative principles, which is education and training. And, uh, and facilitate peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges so that uh, we can all learn from, from one another and, uh, and organizations that work uh, in different countries can, can learn from one another. And, uh, and then with the education and training, we are trying out uh, this new format of offering webinars to, uh, to help people who want to learn more about uh, how to develop housing cooperatives. And, uh, and then we'll... Uh, We'll hopefully have uh, some more of these uh, on different topics. So who is part of Cooperative Housing International? Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, organizations uh, in, in all parts of the world, uh, all over Europe, in the North and South America, in Asia, uh, and uh, Southeast Pacific. So uh, mm -hmm. we welcome new members every year. And here um, you can see some logos of uh, some of our cooperatives, uh, HSB in Sweden. Uh, we have Albi Co-op in France. Uh, Conavi Co-op in Chile, um, we have Lega Co-op Abitanti in Italy, uh, and, uh, and so on. So just to give you an idea of uh, who is part of uh, our organization, um, just trying to move on to the next slide. There we go. 
Um, and uh, we also are part of a, uh, a larger co uh, collaborative housing network called uh, Cohabitat, um, which is uh, formed of uh, different organizations, not necessarily working only in cooperative housing, but in, uh, in uh, collective uh, housing. Uh, so we have uh, World Habitat, Urbamond, uh, the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, uh, Grounded Solutions Network in the U.S., um, Habitat International Coalition, uh, also known as HICS. So, some are, so these are some of the organizations that uh, uh, we get together uh, on a yearly basis to um, plan out how we can collaborate together and uh, and, um, and promote the the uh, the housing model of collaborative housing. Um, I've uh, I've muted everyone from my end, but uh, I do hear a few people. So uh, if you are if your microphone is on, if you could uh, mute yourself, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next slide. All right, very slow. Okay, so just to quickly go over what uh, a housing cooperative is, it's um, it's a form of uh, nonprofit housing. So that means that um, it's a housing that's provided at cost, and, uh, and no one is uh, is making any money out of it. Um, housing cooperatives are controlled by members who have a vote uh, in decisions. There's no outside landlord. Each housing cooperative is a legal association incorporated as a cooperative. Housing co-ops are guided by the international cooperative principles and which are adapted for specifically for housing co-ops. Uh, around the world, the cooperative housing model is flexible and takes many forms. Um, and uh, housing co-ops have, uh, have the right to elect a board of directors, uh, members can run for the board and uh, and they get to review the audited financial statements to show how the co-op is spending their money. They are involved in approving bylaws, rules and major policies and uh, and people can live there for as long as they like um, as long as uh, you know they are abiding by the the rules and and the bylaws. So um, around the world, housing cooperatives uh, take many forms. There's rental cooperatives, there's ownership cooperatives, there's uh, um, limited equity cooperatives and mutual self-help. So I, I won't go over in detail on each of these models, um, but uh, just to show that uh, you know, it's a model that is very flexible and, uh, and very adaptable to, um, to to the, the different um, models that uh, that countries have adapted over over time, and um, so uh, since cooperative housing is a form of collective ownership, uh, it's a, a means of maintaining affordability. Uh, it uh, provides fair, decent, and uh, and viable uh, rents or ownership options. Um, it's also a, a community where people uh, live together uh, and balancing their priorities with, uh, with the cooperative's budget. Uh, there's security of tenure. Uh, the management stru structure of cooperatives gives members a possibility to address all kinds of issues like security issues and implementing solutions that, that benefit everyone. And, uh, and because it's a participatory uh, form of, uh, of housing, there's transparency and major decisions receive approval by the members and, uh, and, and members are involved in ensuring efficient and proper management. And, uh, and cooperatives are also committed to, towards social goals. Uh, through the cooperative, members become aware of social issues and decide together to act. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, I will introduce our, our guest speaker. 
Um, so today we've invited Blaise Lambert, which is who is the CEO of the Confederation of Cooperative Housing in the UK. He's also the treasurer of CHI. Uh, he's an economist by profession, and he's been involved in the cooperative housing sector for over 20 years. He started off by moving into a housing co-op in 1997 in, uh, in London, and uh, shortly after attending a general meeting, um, he, because the co-op was proposing to raise the rent by 17%, uh, that was his uh, motivation to attend that meeting, and he wanted to understand the reasons for such a significant increase. And uh, by the end of the year, he was on the management company, and within a week, he was the treasurer. And uh, shortly after that, uh, he saw an advertisement for the Confederation of Cooperative Housing uh, annual conference, and he went along to see what was going on outside his own co-op. And at the end of that meeting, he was already on the uh, CCH board, and then he was chair within six months, and then the rest is history. So, um, so we're happy to have Blaze uh, uh, explain uh, some, uh, some details, answer some questions on how to start a housing cooperative. So I'm just going to try and move on to the next slide. Oh, looks like it's stuck. Okay, here we go. All right, so I will unmute Blaze. Thank you, Julie. All right, thank you, Blaze. So um, really nice to be able to speak today to uh, all of you that have uh, joined us for the webinar today about some some, some sort of the, the, the early initial stages of setting up housing cooperatives. And what this first slide um, opens up um, is some, some, some initial questions that it's important that people who are looking to set up really any form of cooperative enterprise, but in, in, in this situation, a housing cooperative to, to work through and, and give consideration to at an early stage. Um, so I think the first area of question that, that, that I would advise groups of people to give consideration to is, 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 is as much as possible seeking to define what it is that they're, they're wanting to do, what are they trying to change, what are they trying to affect, um, who, who are they trying to provide a solution for, so to say. And um, I would say that uh, that to an extent um, will also uh, be driven in its initial shaping by, by who is making this happen. And I tend to find three different streams or approaches that people take to setting up housing cooperatives. Either a group of people come together and start something up brand new to either solve their a housing issue that they have um, or, or, a, or a desire to live together as a group of people. Um, or a desire to provide uh, a mechanism for, for new housing in a particular area or geographic location. Secondly, uh, it could be an existing housing cooperative or an existing uh, cooperative of another form or, or other community-based organisation that wants to expand um, or wants to enable uh, a, a, another organisation being set up. Or thirdly, it could be um, a developer or developing organization that has decided for, for whatever reasons that it wishes to, to build co-ops and to create them, so to say. And, 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 and obviously in each of those three different situations, the why are you doing this and the what do you want to achieve can, can, can differ quite significantly. But what is important is that the, the cooperative that is being set up or created has a way in which it can shape and define its its, its objects. It's what are you what are you wanting to do? And its objects, its objectives could be the provision of, of housing or housing services, the construction or development of housing, the conversion of existing homes, the improvement of existing homes, or providing services and support to, to other cooperatives. So that that's that's sense at an early stage of of, of, of seeking, you know in a fairly straightforward manner to, to, to coalesce and agree around what, what are we trying to achieve here. And then what, why a cooperative? So why does the, the, the people that are seeking to achieve something feel that a cooperative is the most appropriate legal structure for them? 
ha have they given have you given consideration to all of the other legal forms that are available and i noticed a question fairly early on that somebody popped up on the screen what's the difference between cooperative and collaborative housing well there are uh, there are various different legal formats and ways in which people can collaborate with each other to solve housing issues uh, of which a cooperative is, is 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 one particular approach to doing that um, and so I think it's important that people have given proper consideration to why do we feel this is the right legal form? Uh, is it the legal form that best suits with those objects? The, the, the what are we trying to do? Um, I, I would expect that, that, that people setting up cooperatives and, and indeed in all the cooperatives I've lived or worked in, this has been a fairly central plank, uh, that, that people setting up cooperatives have uh, most certainly read and thought through the ICA's cooperative values and principles and that these are an important part of what shapes and defines why a group of people are choosing the cooperative form for, for what they're doing. And, and, and again, this, this notion that cooperatives are set up from a trading status perspective primarily to, to, to operate on a not-for-profit um, basis. Um, if, if one of the driving what are we trying to do and why are we trying to do it is to is is is, is to make profits for ourselves as as members in in, in housing cooperatives or to deliver uh, profits to shareholders then maybe the cooperative form is not the appropriate one in, in in a situation where people are seeking to do that so that notion that cooperatives are set up for the benefit of uh, not primarily uh, profit motives what are the financial and business realities? Um, so, so firstly, and one of the first questions I ask people when, when I go and see them and they're looking to set up new courts is, have you got any money? Um, so, uh, you know, what are our financial realities as the people setting these things up? Um, are we going to need to be looking to access grants and loans? Are grants and loans available to, to, to start up cooperatives and, and enable housing cooperatives to, uh, to, to move forward? in the in the country in the region that you're looking to do this uh, is there government support uh, nationally regionally and locally are there agencies that that are in place to it to, to assist and enable people in setting cooperatives uh, cooperatives up or is the is the reality um uh, something different is it uh, that, that you're seeking to do something in a, in a in a government and financial environment that's that's not so supportive what is the legal framework? You know, what is the legal basis on which people are able to to use the cooperative model for housing purposes in, in the country or, or the location that they're seeking to do so? And indeed, you know, different countries will have different legislation and, and different slants on uh, what is desirable to, to them, so to say. Who do you want to benefit? So who are you doing this for? You know, in other words, if we've agreed the objects, who are the objects delivering things for? And is that an exclusive relationship? Does the cooperative operate only for uh, those people that, that are members of it? Or does it operate for, for, uh, for, for the benefit more broadly than just its members? Do, do all people who benefit from the organization delivering on its objects have to be members of it? Um, and, and there are different approaches that people to take um, over that sort of question. How will these people benefit? You know, what, what is it that the, the beneficiaries are receiving? Are they receiving a house? Are they receiving access to a house? Are they receiving additional services? What is it that the cooperative is providing to the people that it's setting up to benefit um, that is specific to it? And is there a geographical, a cultural, an income-based or a tenure-specific approach that, that a cooperative wants to take? So is it trying to solve issues in a particular location or for a particular sector of society? Um, or does it not have that sort of spe specific uh, focus on, on, on certain uh, groups of people or certain locations? Who should own the organization? Uh, cooperatives are owned by their members. So who, who will be the members? How do we decide who, who, who is accepted into membership? Um, how would somebody apply for becoming a member? Uh, what are the entry requirements? 
uh, certain situations I've come across where people can join housing cooperatives uh, at no charge. Uh, I came across a cooperative recently where people had to pay 70,000 euros in, 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 in the first place just to become a member and, and a wide variety of different approaches to, to what membership entails and how you go about uh, becoming a, a member of a cooperative. And, and then when do people stop being members? Um, are there are there circumstances that uh, that, that uh, somebody would no longer be uh, deemed to be a member of the organisation? And obviously, you know, there are some 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 basics there. Um, you know, for example, if someone were to uh, to pass away, for example, but but you know, does somebody cease to be a member member if they move out of one one of the co-op's properties, or do they cease to be a member if? Uh, if they have, you know, breached their occupancy agreement in certain serious, significant ways. So, so what is the, uh, the, the if you like, the uh, uh, the conditions on which somebody becomes and remains a member of the organisation? What are those members' powers and duties? So, what what what, what does this membership mean? What is, you know, what what does somebody get from becoming a member? Well, they get uh, an equal stake in. In, in, in making decisions within and, and governing the, the, the cooperative and therefore having you know an equal and equitable stake uh, within the organization that uh, that in one form or another provides them or, or, or gives them access to a housing solution so how how will these members powers be be exercised uh, usually uh, members powers are exercised through through people attending and or participating in another way. In, in, in the organization's meetings, uh, which is where the, the business of the cooperative gets gets discharged um, at, at a high level, so to say. How are decisions made by the general membership? So how do members make decisions? Our smallest member in the UK has got one house with four people living in it. So how four people make their decisions is, well, primarily by consensus, the four of them sit around and, until they reach agree, agreement. But our largest member's got 13 and a half thousand homes. So the idea that they would make all of their decisions by 13 and a half thousand people sitting around and waiting until they all agree with each other probably means they wouldn't make very many decisions. Um, but there will still be certain decisions that must rest with that, that, that general membership, even when a cooperative becomes as large as 13, 14, 20,000 members and homes. How, how will meetings be arranged? Whose job is it to, to make to set meetings up? How will they be conducted? Moves us on to issues around uh, how, how meetings are chaired. Do we intend to have somebody who is the chair of the organisation, or do we intend to to, uh, to to rotate the chairing of meetings around, um, among members of the, of the cooperative so that there's a a spreading out of, of, of people's involvement and responsibility there and 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 do we set up and agree some some rules for how meetings will be conducted so that uh, uh, so that we've all got a sort of agreed set of principles that that, that, that we've set down at the outset as to how we will run and conduct um, the organization's activities uh, how many people must turn up to meetings is there is is there a requirement both in the law of the country that you're operating in, but more generally within uh, the, the, the legal framework for cooperatives where you're operating, where there is a requirement for a certain minimum number of people to attend meetings. What feels like a sensible minimum number of people? On the one hand, you don't want to have too high a requirement for people to attend, uh, otherwise you may not be able to hold meetings, but at the same time you don't want meetings to, to be held by such a small number of people that the organisation runs the risk of, of, of being, becoming undemocratic um, or being uh, taken over uh, by too small a group of people in that sort of situation. And, and how are these powers, powers and duties exercised? So what I intend to do is after each of the slides, just taking a brief pause to allow the opportunity for any questions that uh, anybody has at, at this point to be raised. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna hand back to Julie briefly at this stage to see whether we've got any specific questions that anybody Okay, I am uh, trying to unmute. Yes, I think. Yeah, so everyone is unmuted. And so does anyone have any any questions to to this that apply to this first slide? 
If you want to just introduce yourself, uh, tell us where, where you're from and if you're uh, working for a particular organization or um, just also to, if you can just keep your question brief so that uh, we can make sure that everyone's questions are heard and then we have to also time to move on to the next slides. So any questions out there? There is one question that someone wrote in, which um, applies more to uh, the, the different models. And it was, uh, if the community land trust model is a type of cooperative housing. Would you like to answer that, Blaise? Well, I think the answer to that is different within different countries. Um, so, it is entirely possible for a community land trust to be set up as a cooperative if, if people wish to do that, but it's also entirely possible to set up a community land trust under a different legal format as well. And, and in the UK, for example, um, people can use community interest companies, community benefit societies, companies limited by guarantee, as well as... Um, so, as I say, it, it, that will differ from, from country to country, but yes, it's entirely possible to do that in certain settings, yeah. And, uh, and I, I had a question that was based on um, one of the last points that you were talking about, the, you know, the, what the, the meetings and, uh, you know, just some of the, the details that you, that you have to consider. And, um, but that's keeping in, you know, in, in consideration that there's existing legislation. What if, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in, in someone's country, there is no law that, uh, you know, that, that is, that, that exists already. So, you know, what, how would you go about, uh, you know, setting up all of the, all of these different questions? Well, I think there's two, there's two issues there in, in, in that, you know, on the, on the first hand, if, if there is no cooperative legislation in a particular country, then you have a choice to, uh, to, to either seek to try and change that, um, which will involve a lot of political work, lobbying and, 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 and such things and won't be something that happens overnight um, and or to set up uh, a different type of legal structure that helps you deliver on the objects that you've set out pending you uh, uh, being able to affect the, the change within, within legislation and indeed again in the UK you know we, we operate in an environment where there is no such thing as cooperative tenure in the United Kingdom and so so we have to operate in, in terms of our relationship with, with our individual resident members on a contractual basis. So that's within contract law rather than within the basis of any firm specific cooperative housing legislation, which, which there isn't. And, and, and so, yes, I would say that both of those issues in terms of, in terms of uh, shaping and adapting what is there currently to, to see, suit your objects and needs and trying to affect change in terms of getting legislation introduced are probably the two uh, the two strands to, uh, to to that all right thank you blaze well we'll take one more question which uh, some which sina has written and her question is is it possible to finance a housing co-op purely from the members deposit yeah it's 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 completely feasible if if the members have money to put in um for for you to self-finance um uh, so so yes that's entirely feasible if if the members have the finance to do that yes all right thank you all right we'll move on to the next slide okay so after giving consideration to who should own the organization in other words who should its members be the next question to be uh, to be considered is who should manage the organization um, now, again, you know, a small cooperative with a small number of people, it may well be the same group of people that are the members and, 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 and manage the organisation through general meetings. They meet as they need to. However, as cooperatives become larger and more complex, it becomes more likely that the members uh, make a decision to, uh, to delegate management down to a management board or some sort of committee, committee um, 
structure within the organization. So if a cooperative moves down the line of separating the, the broad membership from the day-to-day -day management of the organization, in other words, they set up a management board, key questions for thinking through then is, well, how will we choose which members get to sit on this management board? What will be our process for people being nominated, our, our decision-making process, our election process, if, if, if need be? So, so how will we decide which of the 500 of us, if there are 500 of us, get to form the 10 people that sit on the management board? When will somebody stop being on the management board? Is it a job for life? Is it a, is it a role for a year? Uh, what happens when their term comes to an end? How do people either get reappointed or replaced? Uh, how how would a, a management board make decisions? Again, are they going to make decisions by consensus? Are they going to make decisions by by majority majority vote? Are they going to make certain decisions in one way, other decisions in another? How will the meetings of the management board be arranged and conducted? And and again, like with the general meetings. How many people sitting on a management board will have to attend a meeting for it to be a legitimate meeting? Again, one of the things we, 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 we must always be ensuring that we avoid is that power becomes too concentrated in the hands of a small number of people. Um, uh, and, and, and one of the ways of dealing with that is to ensure that a small number of people can't just get together out of your management board number, say two or three of them, and just hold meetings and make decisions that other people are not aware of. So again, you know, how are you managing that that delegation to, to to a management board? And what powers and duties should be delegated to 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 broader governance structures? So I think it's important that in an early stage, the the members sit down and say, right, what functions do we do we need and do we want to keep within within general meetings within the general membership? In certain situations, that might be all of them, fair enough. If they decide that there's going to be a split of functions down to management boards, down to executive staff members, down to subcommittee structures, again, that's a decision that the, that the membership themselves should be driving and, and, and making. There should be a clear record maintained of any decisions around delegation of powers down to subsidiary structures within the organization. And indeed, the, the, the list of delegated functions to a management board should form the, the basic terms of reference for, for that part of the structure. How will these powers be exercised? Again, what is delegated and how are these things delegated? What will be the role of officers, treasurer, secretary, uh, of subcommittees, if, if people determine that they are necessary? And how will decisions be made outside of meetings by people delegated to take those decisions to have responsibility for budgets uh, in other words employees officers and and, and substructures now again in, in particularly small cooperatives that delegation will, will be unnecessary but but once an organization gets beyond a certain size it becomes more and more appropriate and prudent for uh, these 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 structures to be put in place to to, to manage the effective day-to-day -day, uh, issues that crop up either through the development phase of starting up and setting up a cooperative or once a cooperative has built its homes refurbished its homes and is live so to say important to think through what what are we going to spend any surplus funds on so money that, that that we make in excess of our expenditure at the end of the year are there any restrictions that, that, that apply both internally, in other words, that we as a group of people want to decide we will spend our surpluses on this, but not that, or externally? Does the law of the land or, or regulatory systems, for example, place restrictions upon what housing cooperatives can use their surplus funds for? And again, that will differ fairly significantly from, uh, from country to country. And how will decisions be made upon what, what surplus funds get used for? Um, again, I, I would advise against just giving the, the treasurer a free hand to decide what they do with all the money. What are the taxation implications, both for, uh, well, for the cooperative? So what, what areas of taxation will the cooperative need to become registered for? Will it, need, will it be liable for paying, for keeping proper records for? How will it do that? Who will do that? How will the, the members and, 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 if appropriate, a management board take 
take assurance that uh, these issues are being uh, correctly uh, discharged and dealt with. Uh, what are the tax implications for individual members? In certain in certain models, we may be looking at uh, ownership or shared ownership or, or equity staircasing models that may bring uh, tax gains and, and capital gains for the individual members that uh, that they will need to, to ensure they understand the tax implications uh, where relevant there. And what are the tax implications for external investors and for schemes that are funded through particular forms of external investment as well where those forms of external investment may well attract tax treatment from uh, from the tax authorities in a particular country and then finally uh, the final of those the, the, the sort of initial questions is is how will the organization be accountable beyond its member base or will it so is, is membership a requirement for the for, for, for beneficiaries? So if somebody is living in one of the co-ops properties or intends to, to live in the co-ops properties, must they be a member? Or is membership um, open and, and, and for the individual to decide whether they want to take it up or not? If that's the case, how does the co-op maintain accountability to those people that choose not to be members? Um, and, and also, how does the cooperative uh, uphold any accountability that it's had to sign up to when making agreements with governments, with partner organisations, with funders and with lenders. So once again, uh, I'll take a, a, a pause at this stage and take any questions that anybody's got briefly before we, we move on to the, the third slide. Am I assuming we've got no questions? Uh, you've got a question that came in from Rob um, asking you to comment on the difference between cooperative and collaborative housing. Yeah, I mean, I touched on that in the previous slide. I mean, essentially, okay. the, the difference is that there are a myriad of ways that people can collaborate with each other, and a cooperative is one legal structure that allows them to do that. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to push on then. When I get the third slide up. Sorry, Billy, I, I was muted there. I just wanted to bring up another question that uh, uh, Rob okay. Visser wrote uh, about co-ops in uh, in New York City that uh, are not for profit yet they are unaffordable, and he's wondering uh, if that's related to the way members. Uh, or the housing rights are passed on from members that are leaving to the new members that are entering? Well, I suppose the first thing is that um, not all housing cooperatives set up to provide uh, particular price points of housing. So, so it may be that in, you know, a particular cooperative that you might be referring to is actually not set up to provide affordable housing. It might be set up um, for people on higher levels of income. Um, but but also it is it is fair to say the way in which an organization protects itself in terms of realizing the economic gains and 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 uplifts in value come to it uh, in a proportionate manner or, or or maybe completely rather than to the individuals is is certainly an important question in terms of how you maintain the relative affordability that a scheme had when it first started even if its relative affordability was for people on higher incomes. Um, so, uh, so, so yes, I'd make those observations. Um, can I can I come in with an example of uh, one of the co-ops in New York City? Actually, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of um, Harry Belafonte, um, and when he started to get famous, he tried to rent an apartment in New York City um, in Manhattan. Um, he was turned down. Um, from all the rental properties he went to see because he was black. Um, so, for example, one of the things he did was he got uh, a load of people together, um, they bought the building together and created a, a home ownership co-op. So, yes, there are cases where, uh, uh, you know, for example, the co-op principles are put into practice for fairness and equality um, to provide accommodation where people um, have not been able to, to live anywhere 
because of their, their race, colour, diversity, whatever. So there are exceptions um, to some, uh, some of the co-ops that are around, it, particularly in the United States. Thank you, Jane. There's uh, another question, uh, again, from Rob that uh, is asking about the, the choice to delegate management to a board. Does it affect the education and knowledgeability of the members? Well, I think that very much depends upon the commitment of the cooperative to training and education, where cooperatives focus all of their training budget on members of the management board then there is the, the the risk that it creates a two-speed membership where a cooperative realizes that it's just as important to provide uh, routes to training and education to people who are not currently on a management board um, it, it obviously reduces that risk of of, of creating that two-speed environment but also it makes it more likely that other members who you're training up will then be more likely to step forward and play an active role in in, in the management side of things whereas you know, again, if you if you just fail to build the capacity of certain people, it's not surprising then over time that they have less and less of an active role and stake in the organisation. So there are risks around whatever type of structure you choose. Um, it's important to, 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 to see what those risks are and have strategies in place for, for not falling down those, th th those particular traps. All right, thank you, Blaise. One more question from Katarina. Can you give us an example of issues that are governed by bylaws? Not really off the top of my head, um, because, um, because firstly, it would be important for me to understand what the term bylaws means in, in the context of the, the country that the person asking the question is from, really, because it's a term that in different countries means different things. I mean, from a UK perspective, um, there there are, uh, okay, so you're from the UK. Well, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just saw that. I, I'm not entirely sure um, from my experience of living and managing in co for 20 years, what bylaws um, beyond things like building regulations or, or, or regulatory requirements we'd refer to, but I'm quite happy to pick that up outside of the session in more detail with you. Okay, and we'll take one more question that's in the, the, the chat section here is, um, so someone is interested in starting uh, a group with two or three households uh, at first, and, uh, and then maybe progress on to 10. Um, and, uh, sorry, what's the, just to scroll back down to see the rest of the question. I have a very small window, so it's hard to see here. Okay, well, before I find, I'll, I'll go back to that, but uh, there was another question on uh, differentiating, how do you dif differentiate between surpluses and profits? It's terminology. I mean, quite frankly, there is no difference. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's an excess of income <laughs> over expenditure. Um, it's just that not-for-profit organizations use the term surplus um, to refer to the uh, the excesses that they make of income over expenditure, whereas in a commercial setting, people tend to use the, the word profit. There is no real difference from an accounting perspective beyond the terminology of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I found the question here from William Tasker, who's in Newcastle, UK. So he's at the point where he wants to recruit people to form a co-op in his neighborhood. Uh, he wants to raise interests and determine a suitable model. Are there any difficulties in starting a cooperative, for example, with two or three households, then growing to say 10 households or progressing to a cooperatively managed new build? No, there's no problem with that at all. And, and most housing cooperatives, like any business, start off at an initial scale. And then, then if they're successful, they continue to grow and expand. And the, 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 the cooperative I used to live in started with three houses and by the time I moved out of it, it had 450 houses and it obviously didn't jump from three to 450 in one step. So, so it's perfectly normal for, uh, for, for a cooperative that uh, desires a growth model 
um, for it to, uh, to to grow in that uh, sort of step by step manner. Um, so, so yes, there's there's no issue with you seeking to start at a certain stage and then expand over time. It may mean that over time you want to revisit some of these questions, as uh, you know, particularly that type of issue around who should manage and govern organisations becomes uh, more of a pressing issue the larger you will get and the need to delegate and and the need to think about you know how are we providing services to our members over a growing stock base but but there's 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 nothing wrong with you seeking to grow organically and one, so one more question before we move to the next slide uh, should you start with a model and recruit members or should you recruit the members and then agree with a model <laughs> i think it's always better to get your initial group of people together and you know as i started on a couple of slides ago start working with that group of people of what are we trying to achieve here what are our objectives you know who are we doing this for how are we doing it how do we get in and out um, and then choose the appropriate model to enable you to do that i get concerned when people just go and grab legal models off a shelf and then try and squeeze what they're trying to do into the legal model um, it's better to think it the other way around so find you know find what you're trying to achieve and and then look at what's the what's the most appropriate way for us to do this rather than just grabbing at a legal model otherwise you know the, the i i wouldn't really be posing these questions within the uh, um the webinar i'd have just said, go and set something up and then see where it takes you so it's always better to to have some initial some initial thinking around these sorts of questions to help you focus on what's the right type of structure before for us before you go and grab the wrong thing and then have to start spending time reversing and undoing those things right all right thank you blaze we'll move on okay. we're uh, running a little bit short on time so we'll uh well i've got uh, uh, saying less on this screen these are just a couple of the early decisions that need to be taken once you're ready to start going so choose a name uh so you know quite often groups chip choose things you know something that describes who they are or what they do or where they're doing it to or who they're doing it for so the co-op i lived in was called brent community housing it was called brent because that's the part of london it was set up uh, within community because you know it was it was controlled by and run by uh, community members in the area and housing because it was providing housing um check that there are no other organizations that have already taken that name uh, you'll find if somebody else is already set up as, as as a particular name you won't be able to use that name as well um, and check for restricted words uh, a lot of countries have certain words that you're not allowed to use in the name of organizations and that will differ from country to country but uh, it's certainly important to check these things before you start filling in forms and sending fees off agree who your founding members are going to be so you know who's setting this thing up who are the first members how, how are we choosing them you know is it going to be everybody that came to that first meeting is it going to be half a dozen of us who are these first names on on the on the forms going to be and and when will other members be allowed to join how will they how will they join will that be a decision of the founder members how will that transition be managed from the group of people that sign documents to set something up and then the members that control and run it over time and how will that transfer of power from those founders be managed so that it's done in an appropriate and seamless manner as i said earlier on agree on the objects what are you setting out to do you, you'll find right at the top of governing documents of cooperatives the world over will be a section that you know says this is what we're set up to do quite often referred to as objects agree on the area of benefit where are you where are you looking to base your housing co-op and its activities is that a street is it a neighborhood is it a town is it a city um is it the whole country um but but getting some agreement on you know where are we doing this and, and for, for what area are we doing it for understand the process for getting registered so make contact with the relevant company or cooperative registering body within your within your country uh, decide who's going to do this this work of filling the forms out and submitting the applications is there a cost to registering understanding whether there's a fee to uh, to pay to the relevant 
uh, regulatory body that sets up organizations and are there any sponsoring bodies that, that can help you uh, uh, are there any existing organizations or regional support structures or uh, secondary cooperatives uh, or, or national organizations that can help you out with the practicalities of, of filing your application to set up a cooperative and agree who's going to do this work and, and how it will be paid for so who's going to sign the documents uh, do we have the money to pay fees ourselves to set up or are we going to have to look for for a grant or to raise some money from somewhere to pay for any registration fees and do we need the services of a lawyer or an accountant to assist us in setting up and also do we need to be setting up a bank account so that we're able to start trading um, at the point that we're setting up or is that something that, that needs to come a short while afterwards okay again i'll take a brief break and pick up any questions on on this slide while we're waiting for questions there was a question that came in a few minutes ago about uh, surpluses and what is a reasonable amount to set aside for long-term maintenance Well, I think it's important to understand the long-term maintenance needs of your properties and, and the, 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 the relevant sums to set aside. But the relevant sums will be dependent upon that. I wouldn't say that there's a fixed amount of money that you should put aside per property because it just doesn't work like that. You know, certain properties are, are new, certain properties are old, certain properties are of different sizes to each other, have different fixtures and fittings. So it's important to build up what in the UK is referred to as an asset management plan to understand your your long term liabilities for repairs and maintenance on, on your properties and, and to make provisions within your reserves through generating surpluses to be able to at the very least meet those long-term maintenance requirements i hope that doesn't sound like i've dodged the question um but it but, but it isn't a certain cash sum that i could just say well if i can add to that the you know depending on how old your your co-op is you know well actually you know whether it's new or, or an old one it's uh it's always a good idea to to have some studies done so you can invite engineers or professionals to come in and do what they call a building condition assessment uh, and a replacement reserve study so they look at all the components of, of the buildings and uh and then they estimate you know how much life is left and uh, and then estimate you know the, the cost of repairing and, and replacing and then based on on those studies you're able to determine how much money you should be putting aside yes indeed can i push on yep i'm mindful of the time mm -hmm. so um the, the next things to, to, to start building up are, are you know, a, a, a more detailed idea of, of what it is you're seeking to do with your housing cooperative. In other words, clarifying the purpose, the, the why are we doing this? So building up an idea of things like mission, vision and values. Vision, I mean, vision's the dream, the what are we doing it for? The values are the things that matter to us, the mission statement, you know, what will we do to achieve our vision while respecting our values? What are the local housing market needs and conditions? It's important to understand what land is available in the area that you're looking to do things. Uh, what the current supply and demand issues with, for housing are in the local area, where the gaps are and where there are any issues of market failure that your cooperative could step in and address. And what the tenure mix and price points, in other words, the rent levels, the sales prices uh, are that, that will work for the local market, but will also work for your membership as well. What are the priorities of local, regional and national stakeholders? Um, so do your plans sit alongside support or deliver on on public body priorities? Are they consistent with with area and regional plans for development? Is there a preference for cooperatives or, uh, or, or or other company forms within the environment that you're looking to operate in? Clearly, you know, where land is available, your plans sit alongside local priorities, there's support for cooperatives 
it will be easier um, to to move your 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 vision forward um, because because you know things are moving in a in a, a supportive and positive direction. That doesn't mean it's not possible uh, to to create housing cooperatives where the local market and, the, and 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 regional and national stakeholders are not necessarily supporting, but it is a little more challenging. Uh, asking the question of yourselves: Are we just building homes? So is the vision here about homes only, or are we seeking to create mixed-use environments where homes are provided with with a mixture of workspace, office and commercial, retail space, leisure space, community facilities, parking provisions, power generation? So, so what is it that that you're looking to develop, that you're looking to build, that you're looking to create? Is it just a housing product, or is it a product that goes beyond that? And are you refurbishing, redeveloping, or building new properties? And uh, and finally, I would say, uh, what design standards, or I would, would 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 suggest that you need to ask, what design standards are you seeking to achieve in your developments? Build materials. What type of materials are you going to look to use? Uh, what type of build quality are you looking for? Is it are these high-end properties with expensive components, or or a more mid-range or affordable product? Uh, what are the environmental sustainability issues that are relevant to your to, to your development and your plans? And uh, what are your supply chains or your intentions for supply chains? Where are you going to source building materials for your project? Where are you going to source the labour um, uh, to, to do the construction work? Do you intend to build the homes yourselves? Um, all, all important questions to be asked. Again, I'll I'll, I'll take a pause. Um, uh, in fact. We do have a question uh, about land prices, whether they vary between non-profit and commercial developments. Uh, land prices are primarily priced on, on the basis of what the, the, the market valuation for, the, for that land is. I mean, it's, it's unusual that a landowner will have two different prices, one for, for a private sector developer and one for a, for a cooperative developer. That's not to say that you you can't come across landowners that uh, that have a, a different perspective in terms of realizing value from their land um, but more often than not land is priced on the basis of what it's worth in the marketplace rather than who's looking to develop on it all right thank you blaze okay so next slide clarifying your purpose so so yes just picking up on that uh, that question that was just asked you know where will the land come from and and also where will the money come from so you know d does does the group does the project already own or already have uh, a site identified or a site that it owns um, is a landowner part of your project or are they willing to sell or lease land uh, to your your organization and willing to do that at a, at a valuation um, that that creates a competitive advantage for, for what you're seeking to do over a, over a private developer. Can the landowner uh, do that? I mean, certain public uh, bodies that own land are not able um, to to offer um, uh, what at, at times, certainly in, in 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 an environment over here, is referred to as state aid assistance. Um, so so where's the land coming from? Uh, is a landowner part of what you're seeking to do? Are you looking for public or private land or a combination? In terms of money, again, you know, that first question, do you already have some? Uh, does members of the group have access to, 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 to cash and to equity? Or are you seeking to do a development where you're going to need to raise all the money um, or a component of the money? So how do you intend to raise that money? Uh, through equity investments, through loans, through commercial debts, through grants? through external investors, through through creating cross-subsidy from doing non-housing development that makes a profit, that cross-subsidizes your development? And how do you intend to service any debt? In other words, how do you intend to pay for any debt that you're taking on to enable your development? Do you have any existing assets? Certainly existing organizations that are just looking to expand or do new, new developments will, will probably be in a better position from the fact that they have existing assets that can be used to, to, to lever uh, extra finance in, into a new development, whereas a new startup group might not be coming from a position where it has existing assets. 
can you do this yourself or would creating a strategic partnership be approach uh, be appropriate so again are you a startup an existing organization or an enabling developer what's the scale of your vision you know how how big is this plan uh, the bigger it is um, the, 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 the more you need to ask yourselves questions of do we have all the skills, knowledge and experience that we need? Do we have training needs? How are we going to fill those training needs? What are we going to do in the meantime? Or could we bring a partner in to, to ac bring access to land, to finance and to expertise and to share some of the risks um, in, involved with it within the project that we have in mind? And what are the key actions and timescales? Try not to create an initial, an initial action plan with a hundred ideas um, and so many things to do in a short space of time, because that's unlikely to actually achieve very much. Watch out for the serial volunteer, the person who's always putting their hand up in the air and volunteering to do everything, uh, but also at the same time creating passengers within the core group, uh, trying to spread round the tasks and the responsibilities uh, across a small and focused number of actions and, and timescales is, is certainly a more appropriate way of taking those, those early steps forward in terms of building your plans up and, and starting to deliver. Um, and, um, and, and who's pulling together that plan? You know, who's doing that work? Who's writing this? And how will the rest of us keep that person or those people under review? And how will we ensure that the work actually gets done so that our ideas translate off of the flip chart and into something more usable and useful for us to actually start pitching our proposals out um, to, to, to landowners, investors, uh, government bodies and, and, and funders and other supporters. Again, I'll take a final break before moving on to the final slide. So uh, another question related to land uh, land prices. So if a public landowner restricts the development to non-profits, would it have an effect on the market value of the land? Well, it may well have a, 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 an impact upon the likelihood that for profit developers would look at that site because clearly if a landowner is saying i'm not going to sell this to for profit developers it would it would push them out of the marketplace but whether that that's whether that itself would necessarily affect land values will be will be very much dependent upon the local market um, and, and and regional differences so there are circumstances where i could show you examples and say yes that's happened and it's depressed values there are other circumstances where if groups are trying to do things in very overheated marketplaces with a with a very limited restriction on land supply, that may make no difference at all. So, so there will be variation there. All right, thank you. So we don't have any other questions on that slide, so we'll move on to this one, forming your group. So yeah, the, the final screen uh, that, that, that I'm going to cover briefly on, on this session then looks at uh, so some initial thinking around how you develop the group of your group of people. How do you become uh, a functioning cooperative, a functioning group of people pulling in the same direction? So s important things here, scoping your scheme with initial stakeholders. So doing some early drawings, some early sketch layouts, getting an idea of what, what it is you're looking to develop so that you can go and seek, seek to build support and, and, and build in the interest of of, of people in the outside world, outlining the key things about your scheme, things like size, quality, cost, who's it for. Um, so building up that idea of, you know, what are we seeking to do and who are we seeking to do, do it for in a way that goes beyond the sort of theoretical mission statement and, and section within a rules document to here's an actual scheme and here's what we're looking to do here. Important that groups are able to access the advice and support that they will need to help them bring their project to fruition. So where do they go for that advice? Um, so are there existing cooperatives that, that you could go and visit um, and find out what they've done and how they've done it and who they've worked with? Are there consultants that operate uh, in, in, the, in the, 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 the local area that are there to support cooperatives and housing cooperatives to get up and running and, and, and scope out their projects. Uh, how, do you, how do you ensure quality of that consultant advice? 
Are there any quality assurance uh, frameworks or processes in place with regard to professionals? Are there professional trade bodies that people have to be members of that help to give you reassurance that the people that you're getting advice from actually know what they're talking about? Um, is there is there existing cooperative infrastructure and, and and business development infrastructure locally, regionally, and nationally within your within your country? Um, organizations that are set up and funded to help people move projects forward and and set organizations up. Um, similarly, are there international bodies like uh, like CHI that you can that you can approach for advice and assistance around? Uh, building your your ideas and, and and building your group's functionality, ensuring group development itself. So making sure that uh, you move from a, a situation where you have a collection of people who who might coalesce around an idea to a functioning group of people that are focused on what what they're seeking to do and how to make the decisions and move things forward to to, to get to the end game, so to say. Um, it's very easy to get lost in in detail somewhere along the line if you're not effectively chairing your meetings and you're not a, a functioning group. Uh, so who does what in the organisation? How are meetings conducted? And what training is provided for individuals, but also training for the group so that the group is able to learn together and learn to become that functioning, effective uh, organisation. Agreeing decision-making process and basic governance structure. Um, so, so again, I'd, I'd advise people against making decisions to tie everything they do to consensus because, because the reality is that that might seem like a very good way for starting things. But if two years into you doing a development, someone has a locked toilet, and rather than getting somebody to clear the toilet out, you have to organise a meeting and have a discussion about it and wait till you all agree to clear the, the person's toilet. Well, they're not going to be very happy. And the cost of you making that good once things have flooded into the property could be a lot more than if you would got a plumber out in the first place. Um, so agreeing decision making processes and that sort of delegation system, systems of delegation, who's going to be making what decisions do go and uh, visit existing schemes, consider which are the right ones for you to go to, not just to get advice, but for inspiration, uh, for access to support, for contacts and networks, and also for potential routes to, to investment and financial support. And then finally, think about the long-term sustainability. Setting up a housing cooperative is not about just building some homes now. It's about creating long-term, sustainable, functioning community organizations. So how is the organization going to be su sustainable over the long term in terms of its properties, its scheme? So coming back to those issues around asset management planning, uh, around long-term uh, uh, stock conditions surveying and, and, and building up that side of the, the, the long-term sustainability, but also for the cooperative as, as, as a body, as an organization. How does it sustain over the long term when those initial enthusiastic founder members have, have moved on or, or 20 years have passed on? So thinking about how we're going to do long term sustainability is critical rather than waiting until you're in the long term and then thinking, oh, dear, maybe we should have put some money aside to maintain these properties or think about who's going to move in here after the initial group of people have moved on. I'll take any final questions, um, but at the same time, I hope you found um, uh, uh, these parts of the session uh, informative and, and, and interesting. And, and as I say, I'll take any final questions that anybody's got. I don't see any additional written questions in, in the chat box. If, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can unmute your, your microphone. If not, uh, we'll move on to the, the concluding sides. So hearing none. So the hopefully, uh, since this is our first webinar, we're, we're kind of testing the waters a little bit. We, uh, we want to offer uh, you know, opportunities for people to, you know, to, to log in and, uh, and listen to some, uh, to some experts, to people who have a lot of experience in, uh, in developing housing cooperatives. And uh, so we're planning on, uh, on doing this on a monthly basis. 
the next one will be on Friday, February 21. We haven't set a, a time yet, but uh, you know, seeing as we are inviting people from all over the world, it's uh, it's going to be difficult to find a time that accommodates everyone. But uh, you know, generally around this time, we'll uh, we'll probably you know accommodate the the most amount of people. But um, I will be sending out uh, an evaluation uh, after this webinar, and uh, feel free to comment on, you know, the timing that, uh, you know, that would be, you know, more useful to to you or, you know, to to, uh, you know, your colleagues or, or friends that you know that would be interested in uh, in, uh, in in joining a webinar. So the next webinar. Uh, we plan to talk about uh, building your core group, and uh, you know, and uh, and then moving on from that to to growing your membership, seeking expert advice, uh, you know, getting external support from uh, from from professionals, from uh, from cooperative housing associations, from uh, technical resource groups, and uh, and then uh, lastly talking about the construction phase where there's lots of decisions to be made and uh, and and lots of uh, uh, lots of engineers and uh, construction experts to you know to meet with and uh, you know and, and this phase usually you know goes on for for quite a while and so so those are the topics that we'll we'll be touching on and in the evaluation form we'll, we're asking you know what other topics you'd be interested in in hearing about so uh, so please fill that out and uh, and uh, just a reminder that uh, we, you know, th this session was recorded. So if there's anyone that uh, you know would be interested in listening in to this, uh, we'll be sending the, the the link to the recording, and uh, and feel free to share that with uh, with anyone. And don't forget to follow us on uh, social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. And our website is uh, housinginternational.coop. And we have a, a resource section on the website that is full of resources. There's documents on there that uh, that talk about how to start a housing co-op. Uh, there's resources on uh, you know on on governance and on management. Uh, resources in in different languages. So uh, so please uh, visit our website uh, and check that out to to see if there's anything there that would be helpful for for you and your group. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you again next time.